here with Rich and Allen and all those folks and understanding how people want some space. When you, uh, when you, when it boils down, you have to ask yourself, how is it? And, and, and I say this in this regard because there's, in this, in this climate, there's so much, uh, it's so much animosity. And some of that animosity comes from folk who believe the same thing principally and morally. And so how is it possible, though, that we have that going on and we can't seem to come together to eliminate that vestige of separation? Because every time you, anytime there are opportunities to remain apart, then you feed into the data tells us that people who attend multicultural churches tend to be more open to change, more uh, understanding and take on um, the posture of you know, really getting to know about people, carry less of the baggage of prejudice and racism. Those people who don't uh, attend church, uh, attend a multicultural church, tend to be, even in segregated churches, on both sides of the aisle, black and white, tend to be hardened in their prejudicial perspectives. So it's not good. And yet we have it every Sunday. I pastor a church. I've been pa in pastoral ministry for over 30 years. I have, in all the churches I've been a part of, the African American Baptist Church, so if you have a thousand Baptist members, you probably have a thousand fights going, okay, we'll go there, so anyway. <laughs> um, but what I have discovered is I have never seen in the churches in this district, for example, a white person attending that church, ever. I have, I've, I've pastored white students, but I've never pastored white adults. You may go into a white church, like some of the larger ones here in the Methodist church, in the Baptist churches, and they will have African members, and they will have some African American members who tend to come from other places, but you never have. So the question is, why is that? In that place, where we all claim to believe mostly the same thing, and, and, and can recite some of the same scripture and songs and procedures and liturgies and all of that, how is it? How is it that we're not able to cross that threshold, man? That's what I want to know. And so there have been examples for us. Um, Rodney Wu, for example, in Houston. Houston is underwater right now, but there's a church, Wilcrest Baptist Church. Rodney Wu started a church 18 years ago that, was, that has representation from 40 nations. And so we'll get into some of that. How do you do that? And would that work in Alabama? I don't think so. And I need to get Richard up here and Dr. Bailey in a minute to talk about uh, some of the churches that have been established. Uh, and, and here's the thing. I teach political science. And oftentimes I talk to students about the controversial issues. Uh, and at the base of most of those uh, conversations we have, that which frames their perspective and their perspectives tends to be their faith. Now, I won't get into the other. I, I'm going to stick with an area where I'm comfortable with and uh, I won't dabble into Buddhism and Muslims and that sort of thing, but let me just talk about what, because this is the South and Alabama predominantly, predominantly is a Protestant uh, Christian uh, faith-based state. Um, I think it's important that we who are, so if David and I are friends and colleagues, it seems to me that uh, first of all, there will be a better way for us to communicate with, with each other. Whites and blacks, when it comes to religion, and we're going to get there and talking about different worship styles and homogeneity and all of that to see if it will help us get where we need to go. But if David and I are friends, we ought to at least be able to talk to each other. Dr. Powers, I've only known just a little bit, and I feel like right now I can just go and talk to him, have a conversation. Just met Dr. Twiggs last night, can have a conversation, can look at him and talk to him and be talked to in return. And yet, why do black Christians? And let me tell you why, and I'll shut up. One of the reasons this is such a challenge and, 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 and it's hard the day, the, the day after the election, I'll go there. When we, and, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, um, I'm laying it bare, I'm being honest, I'm not being all formalized and, and dignified with my PhD and all that. I'm just telling you, the day after the election, many people were hurt and angry, and when we heard that 81% of evangelicals put Donald Trump in office, and when people at my job said to me, 
and they go to church, because that's what we talk about all the time, and they said, we voted for him too. I said, my God, what, what are these people reading? How do they understand love thy neighbor and the precepts that Jesus talked about? Or Walter Rauschenbusch about social justice? Or any of the great church fathers? Where are these people? And so I was, you know, I said, well, okay. That's the world that we live in. What happened to principle over popularity? So, you know, that's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm, I had to apologize to a very conservative friend of mine who is a, an evangelical, because I told him if I'm a Christian, I'm not, unlike you guys, I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. And I was mad as heck. And I said, I apologize to you. Because I have no right to impose my views on you, even though I wish you did believe what I believe, politically it is. And you voted where you voted, I owe you an apology, because we have to have a conversation. And if I'm mad, the angry black man, if I'm mad, we can never have that conversation. And so, um, the walk in the shoes of Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was a, a Dr. King associate in letter nonviolence training for us, reminded me, the old football player, you can't always react. Sometimes you have to walk in somebody else's shoes. And so for me, to help understand where we are with this moving the church forward, getting out of segregation, I had to put myself in the other shoes. And so that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to understand. I, do, I, I, do I think we'll ever become desegregated in the church? No. Never. I'm serious. So I'll be quiet. Uh, I want to jump in right there with uh, Dr. Green mentioning Bernard Lafayette and his nonviolent work. And what it immediately took me to was this wonderful account that I read about the Reverend James Lawson, who was mm. a hugely important, uh, really worked to shape Dr. King's understanding of nonviolence and especially shape the views of nonviolence for young people in the struggle, African American and white together, and was right in the heart of those nonviolent workshops in Nashville. We always think about Greenville, Greensboro, excuse me, as the birth of the sit-ins, but it's really Nashville in some ways mm -hmm. where there's this remarkable youthful energy taking place. Uh, but uh, Reverend Lawson was once uh, uh, at a protest and a, a sort of young stereotype rough-looking uh, white person, defender of white supremacy, and very open about it, uh, came up to him and uh, just spat in his face, just all over his face. Uh, and you sort of think, what does somebody who practices nonviolence do under those circumstances? I always try to tell my students, imagine being nonviolent when somebody's putting a cigarette out on your neck. I don't think the human genome is really wired for nonviolence. Uh, and Reverend Lawson, um, he reached, uh, uh, instead of reaching for his own handkerchief, he said to the gentleman, do you have a handkerchief I could borrow? And the guy reached in his pocket and gave him a handkerchief and then he wiped it off and he said, um, do you ride motorcycles or are you a hot rod guy? Uh, and the guy said uh, that he was into motorcycles. And, and just like that, Reverend Lawson started this conversation where he met somebody, instead of engaging them at the level of retaliation, He's seen somebody who we, we would classically define as an enemy as a human being. Uh, and I think this is where I think Dr. Green is, has articulated the issue so clearly. How is it that those who adhere to the Christian mm -hmm. faith, mm -hmm. and let's start there, and I yeah. want to say one disclaimer is that I'll, I know before it's all said and done, I will have done this, I will have said uh, the black church or the African American church or white Christians, and, and all of us know, I think, in this room, and Dr. Bailey and Dr. Powers have done a really masterful job at this earlier. Uh, that's such a diverse array of people, mm -hmm. right? There, We might talk about the black church tradition or the invisible church, uh, but there's this wonderful diversity. And yet there are these generalizations that may be helpful to make and, and challenging to, uh, to talk about. Uh, but I think when Dr. Green asked that question about how is it that people who look to the same book, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly maybe people who subscribe to the notion of scriptural inerrancy, mm -hmm. how can you see those texts? Uh, and I want to do it just in case I forget. Last night we had dinner with Dr. Green's uh, wonderful wife, Diane, and, and their lovely daughter, Janelle. Uh, and we started talking about that, that explosion of rubber bracelets some years <laughs> back. Uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Uh, and what Diane Green said that was just totally arrested me um, was that those initials were wrong. It shouldn't be what would Jesus do. It's what 
did Jesus do? Yeah. Uh, and there I think there's this level of myopia mm -hmm. where we don't look. Despite talking and ending all our prayers, those who subscribe to the Christian tradition, in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. there's, it seems to me, precious a little of in Jesus' footsteps sometimes <laughs> when, we, when we get to these, these moments. So I want to say a couple more things before I toss things back to Johnny. And, and one is this difficult conversation that Johnny had with, with a friend, but mm -hmm. a friend who he was angry at. Uh, uh, our church had a visitor, a gentleman named uh, Reverend Paul Roberts, who's a theologian and the head of a seminary in Atlanta, a historically black seminary. Uh, and he talked about an encounter, and this was months before the presidential election, but in some ways it speaks to this exact same divide with a dear friend, a white friend, who said to him, Paul, we need to get it. That is, we white people, we need to get it. And you need to get over it. You black people need to get over it. We need to get it, us whites, and you, African Americans, you need to get over it. Uh, and I thought, how is he going to unpack that? And then in, for 45 minutes, and, and the first thing that, that his voice shook, you could just hear him go back to that place, because I thought, that's really, uh, I would have to be mighty close to Johnny before I would say something <laughs> like that to him, right? And so a part of me had this admiration for somebody saying something, but, but, but hearing Reverend Roberts talk about it, how outraged he was, and yet how much he cared about this friend that he... He was angry, but he also wanted to talk to him about it and to try to figure out how do we speak across this divide. And it got me thinking in advance of today about this notion of uh, long memory. Uh, John Blassingame, mm -hmm. who's one of the, the most brilliant historians of the African-American experience in slavery, uh, he and Mary Frances Berry wrote this wonderful book called Long Memory. And, and this speaks to what Dr. Powers uh, referred to and, and that wonderful question that you asked about, don't we just need to re-engage with our history? Uh, and what we have in this country, I think, is, and, and uh, scholars have said this uh, for decades, is a segregation of memory. Uh, and it's pretty profound. Uh, and so I think we see that beautiful photo that Dr. Powers showed of the young, I think it was Burke High School, I wrote it down here somewhere, Burns High School, I, I may have not gotten it right, but the celebrating uh, Burke High School, 154 years of emancipation. You're celebrating all those years of emancipation, and I think we tend, we, maybe white people particularly, uh, see emancipation as a moment, as a transitory experience, as a crossing over, where one moment one is enslaved and the next moment one is free. Uh, Leon Litwack had a book called Been in the Storm So Long about the first generation of African Americans encountering and experiencing and embodying freedom. And I can still see the block quote on that page, and I wish I could do it word for word, but, but this, this young woman is watching her father respond to the moment of emancipation, and she says, uh, Daddy went down to the creek, um, and she talks about seeing her father sort of baptizing himself in the waters of the river uh, and saying, I'm free, I'm free, thank God Almighty I'm free. That's that moment of emancipation. That's a moment of crossing over. But we lose sight of the fact that emancipation, it's the long emancipation. It's the long memory. And so what does emancipation look like as this long night's journey into what we hope will be a day? That, I think, is, is the really challenging question. And if our memories are segregated and we can't acknowledge that emancipation is an ongoing process, that reconstruction is not done, right? Some mm -hmm. scholars talk about a first reconstruction and then talk about the uh, civil rights era as a second reconstruction. And I feel like we're desperately in need of a third reconstruction uh, in this country. Uh, but we're dealing with different streams of history. Vincent Harding has a wonderful book called There is a River. And he talks about African American history as part of this river of history. And so many times there's this inclination, well, if you're interested in black history, take yeah. that course. You know, if you're interested in black political science, maybe take this course. Uh, but this notion that you can somehow hermetically seal off African-American history and not recognize that it's fundamentally part of American history, just as women's history. You can't segregate waters. We tried that in the South, right? We had the black beaches and the white beaches, but children could see through that, right? Like, why is the white water fountain, what's different about that water? 
well, you just can't, you know, you can't drink from that. Well, children see these things. Uh, and so I think uh, I want to hand it back off to Johnny, but I want those of you who may be old enough to remember what it was like to grow up Jim Crow, even in that twilight period where Jim Crow is sort of partially loosening its hold on the South, that we tend to focus on African Americans and their sort of epiphanies of when they realized that how deeply racism was embedded in the fabric of America. But I think we sometimes forget that whites had those epiphanies too. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting topic. And if we could get white folks and African American folks and all folks talking about their experiences with race in a candid way, um, I think it's that conversation that Dr. Powers and the wonderful questioner is calling for, a dialogue and him channeling uh, Archbishop Tutu. That is always what South Africans in the last 20 years have been doing so brilliantly, is to say, we cannot look forward until we look backward. We ha if we're gonna have truth and reconciliation, we have to look that truth squarely in the face and acknowledge the horrors of what happened in this country. Uh, and then we can talk about forgiveness. And to me, Tutu is so remarkable because of that emphasis on forgiveness. But you can't forgive, you can't get over it until you look at it. I think, thank you, thank you, David. I, I think one of the er areas where the church is not stepped up to the plate is in social justice and it's because it's received such a bad uh, description and such a bad reputation um, when, you, when it comes to people who consider themselves church men and church women uh, people are going to get caught up in it's the journey of an individual in their relationship to God and we, we quickly forget about sort of the corporate uh, perspective on our responsibility to our fellow man uh, and I remind our, our, my members all the time, if <clears throat> the Israelites uh, could question the justice of God by asking about why do the heathen rage? Why is it that uh, people who are bad get away with stuff? It seems to me that if they could raise those questions to God, it seems to me that as Jesus followed in those footsteps, we who are believers of faith, men and women of goodwill, that we would also take those same questions and expound them and embrace them so that when we have an issue like this, which is uh, fueling uh, the white separatist, you know, white supremacist sort of movement, it will help us to be able to you know, come together. Right now, there's a lot of fracturing in our country. Uh, and uh, in, in the old days, um, churches, black and white churches would worship together, you know, and do that kind of thing. Uh, and that was good for a little bit of what we call Dr. Powell's reconciliation, but you can't recon when you've never been conciliated. So we, we got a lot of work to do, right? And so, but I, I think that there has to be a beginning point and a starting place. Dr. Bailey mentioned some things and the audience didn't pick up on it. Uh, of course, they weren't part of privy to our conversation last night. But did y'all know there's so much wonderful, rich history in this state that we just don't know about it, about black people and white people in the 30s and 20s? And it's just over our heads. And we're fighting battles and just like bad children, wasting precious time and energy when we could be learning about ourselves and talking about the things that's old history that would empower us, man, to do some things that we may not be comfortable doing. So for example, I understand culturally, for, so, so black Baptists, 99% of black Baptists attend a, one, uh, a uniracial church. Years ago, I pastored a large church and we had this conversation. Um, Charlie was a member there. And one of the things that came up when we started promoting multiculturalism was what's going to happen to those old songs and our worship style. That's number one. Number two, who's going to be in charge? No, I'm serious. That was a very valid and very serious questions, question. And so how will we, who will do? And so those are very real questions and perspectives that you have to take into account. So let's say that those don't, we don't get the favorable multicultural answer. What else, but what could we do? There are a lot of things we can do if we claim to believe the same things. And the first thing we need to do is just talk to each other. In the South, one of the things that happens a lot of times is, uh, this is 
something that occurs among black pastors, so I'm kind of giving you an insight to just one thing, okay? Not all, one. It's typically because we tend to be bivocational. I happen to have four degrees, and so I'm okay. I, you can have whatever you want when you come around me. Most white ministers come around us when we're in events. They're seminarily trained. A, a number of black pastors automatically feel, it's almost like a racialized perspective, almost feel inadequate automatically, that they don't measure up. So that causes room for friction. That's leadership. What do you think is going to happen at the people to people level? So we've got to fix those kinds of things where there's mutual respect and understanding uh, and engage one another and have conversations and go um, from there. Uh, social justice is, a, is another hot button issue because um, in the African American church, um, we are, by way of theology and praxis, seriously into Walter Austin Bush. It's, it's, if you think about our, our journey, it's, it's a natural. When our other brothers and sisters, whether it is a legitimate uh, explanation or seen as a crutch, don't hold to that same theological perspective. And so until we can work some of those kinds of things out, I think we're going to have repeated circumstances and situations like we're experiencing now. And what's critical about that is, is you get young people like a Dylan Roof who's raised in a... So, so people who are reared around people from different cultures and backgrounds don't do what he did. So if, if for nothing else but self-interest, it seems to me that we would exchange ideas and have conversations so that we don't create Dylan Roof. And I'm not, I'm not blaming him, I'm just telling you what I know what the data tells us and shows us. So, and in a deep south state like Alabama, that would, <laughs> that would be very helpful um, because we, we like to carry guns and do all those other things, okay. So, um, in Alabama, well, in the nation, and there are, I can hear some of you saying, well, there are churches here, um, there's a local church here that's multicultural. Um, it's part of what I call a franchise church. I ain't mad at them, but it's what it is. Uh, and those kind of churches pull up the numbers of diversity, but on an average, uh, in an average church, that's not true. You, you, don't, you have very little, very, 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 very little diversity. So if we can't, we can't worship together, um, and I work with colleagues here in this town, uh, many of the events I attend, I'm the only black person in the room with my white colleagues, and we're talking faith matters. So it's just, it's just a challenge, and, and I love the topic because Dr. King was right in 68. What, 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 what? Segregated hour at 11 o'clock? Yeah. And so that's where we are. And so I hope you can help us think through, talk about criticize us and tell us, no, you're wrong there, you're right, you know, so we can help fix this problem. Yes, please. I keep calling their names. Mary. Just. And I think what we'd really value here um, is the same kind of wonderful questions that you've already <laughs> asked today. And, and and don't be shy, right? Uh, in the sense that um, uh, these are tough questions. And I, I think uh, Johnny has probably lived this being one of, uh, we always talk about the Harold Alonzo Franklin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the uh, Elizabeth Eckford at, at Central High. We talk about that, that first generation of African Americans who so courageously broke through so many different color lines, Jackie Robinson for the Dodgers in 47. And then what we often lose sight of is what happens to the children coming on? What happens to them the next? And so Johnny is a perfect example of somebody who came to Auburn, and, and we all know that Auburn is still not nearly as diverse as we need it to be. Uh, but when Johnny tells that story, I think of the first time I taught my civil rights history course here, and here was this one young African-American man sitting in, you know, front row center, uh, and any time somebody would ask a question, it was, and nobody, you know, I, I want to believe that nobody meant uh, anything, but it was, 
here you are now. Please speak for the entire African American experience, right? Uh, and uh, and and imagine, you know, that. Uh, and so, until we get to a more diverse place, um, we place a tremendous burden on our diverse colleagues to sort of uh, do the heavy lifting. Uh, I found it really refreshing some years back when a historian just said, "Enough! If I'm asked to serve on one more committee." Uh, to be that diverse face, uh, and and we want that diversity, but we've got to figure out how to how to do it. So uh, so we welcome your questions. questions. Yeah. Um. If nobody has a question, I have a comment. Can uh, let me see if I can turn this microphone on. Can can you all hear me okay? All right. We uh, were talking last night. And uh, I brought out a couple of points. I want to throw out a couple of points with you all this morning. When people talk about Auburn University, I want to tell you a couple of things you might not know about Auburn University. Auburn University might not be as slow in trying to break color barriers as people might think. In the early 1950s, Auburn University was the first major university in this state to invite a black person to serve as a professor here. Isaac Hathaway was working at Tuskegee University and Auburn University invited that guy in the early 1950s to join the faculty here. It was Hathaway's decision to go to Alabama State from Tuskegee instead of coming to Auburn University to work. He had worked here part time. Now just think how the history of this state might have changed had Hathaway joined the faculty at Auburn University in the early 1950s instead of leaving Tuskegee to go to work at the Alabama State. I just want to throw that out. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what would they do at your church if a person of Asian descent or Hispanic descent or um, some really far out a Martian came to your church? What would they do? A Martian. <laughs> <laughs> The most successful multicultural churches are churches where uh, two or three things in play. Either there's a neighborhood they can draw down from, or, the lead or there's a mission out, out, out the gate, or uh, the leadership will have in its head that that's what they want to do. And finally, uh, you have to have part of that leadership team, and I know that's sort of a different question than what you were saying, um, part of the leadership team has to be multicultural itself. You can't have an all-white church, I mean all-white leadership team and a multicultural church. You got to have it, it's got to be representative. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be genuine, it's got to be real. It can't be phony and that sort of thing. You, you know, you can't be like a $3 bill talking to people with $5 aspirations. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was just worried he might be here. <laughs> this is Dr. Wayne Flint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, thought, I thought he looked familiar. I think the figure of 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump. Is 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump? Yes. 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 Yes
what, <laughs> what question do you need to ask your new pastor to broaden the multicultural? What is, the, what is her perspective on recruiting members from a different background? I mean, she comes from a dock and way in Mobile. Okay. And everything I've, I've learned from talking to her is that she would be very much favored with that. Uh, I have visited Joe and I visited Dock and Way uh, in the past, and there are some black members in Dock and Way. It's not that, oh, as you said, black members still tend to want to uh, worship together. It is a choice I think many times they make. We are. Hey, Robin, here's what we believe. Here's what we'd like to see you do. Well, Is that a problem? Well, that, that's okay, but can you articulate that specifically? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask her. I mean, to me, it seems to me that you want to know what kind of interaction she's had with other, I guess, let's just call it other blacks in her community, in her local community. I want to know, what, I think what I want to know is what can we do to increase, we do have so a lot of Asians in our church, and, and these, are, these families are so ensconced that their children are acolytes. Wow. Mm -hmm. and and you said United Methodist, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, just interject uh, 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 a couple of things, just kind of based on my background and, and orientation uh, toward, toward history. You know, um, in Charleston, well, actually, let me, let me back up. When, uh, when our book came out uh, on, on Mother Emanuel, uh, we found out that there were two churches, one black, one white, both Baptist churches in Macon, Georgia. And, 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 and some of you all might have seen this. It was a segment on 60 Minutes, I, I recall. And they, the two churches, one black, one white, practically had the same name also. And they were located proximate to one another, very mm -hmm. close. And uh, they're in the Baptist tradition. But, but they had no relationship, no connection to one another whatsoever. And when this incident happened at Mother Emanuel, and I think the ministers uh, had heard about our book also, one of them decided, wait a minute, what we're doing here doesn't make any sense. We are, we're so close to one another, mm -hmm. we're right here, but we don't know one another. And now, I don't know how physically close they were, but the idea is they're, they're, they're pretty close. And so, so, for example, in Charleston, uh, right downtown on Calhoun Street, on either sides of Calhoun Street, there is Bethel Methodist Church, which is the white church, and then there's Old Bethel Methodist Church, which, which is the black church. They're, they're literally right across the street from one another, and Old Bethel came out of Bethel. The black church came out of the white church. In fact, the building they worship in, the building the black church worships in, was formerly the building that the white church worshiped in. So, 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 so why, why am I telling you these things? I'm telling you these things because perhaps uh, you could, and in any community, churches that now seem to have no relationship to one another, historically maybe they have, and if there's an investigation back into the historical possibly connections, that can be the basis for conversation and then coming together now. 
so that that that's that's one thing that I would uh, that I would suggest, and it could it could possibly work. You yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, first of all, I think it would be a good idea at all of these church churches on Sunday morning if the pastors were to announce that heaven won't be segregated. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Announce that first and foremost. That's Won't right. be segregated. That's right. And second, for all of these churches who want to increase diversity, first of all, find some sincere people who want to address the issue head on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some sincere people. The people are out there. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that Sunday morning, many churches across this nation will be empty in terms of what the population used to be like a couple of uh, decades ago. People are not going to churches because I think a lot of them feel that something is missing. If the leadership in the churches became sincere, we know where the people are. I spoke at a black church in Memphis, Tennessee in March 2006, and that black pastor told me that he had been invited to interview for the pastor of one of our, I'm from Montgomery, prominent churches in Montgomery. And the pulpit committee, one pulpit committee member asked him this question. If someone from the housing project called the church and wanted someone to come and pick up some people from the housing project in the church van, what would you do? And this pastor told me he would get the church van and go and get them. And not a single person at pulpit committee said a word, and he didn't get the job. Now, that's a black church, and we're talking about black mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that our church does that. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. and, and, but the, my point is I'm, I'm firmly convinced mm -hmm. that um, these people that some of these churches say they're interested in, first of all, recognizes sincerity and if we come across as being insincere in issuing the invitations the people are not going to uh, find themselves too interested in coming and what one pastor told me a long time ago when you get these people to come to your church lock the back door <laughs> don't give them a back door find something for them to do something that's meaningful and this doesn't only applies to your churches, this applies to your institution when you get new faculty people, this applies to your jobs when you get new employees, find something meaningful for people to do and you'll find they won't be eager to leave and all of these people know someone else who's looking for a job, looking for a church, looking for a football team or whatever the case might be and when the word spreads that that church really values your membership you won't have to go out looking for anybody. The Chamber of Commerce in New York City doesn't have to spend the same amount of money recruiting businesses and people coming to New York City as some of the other cities have to do because who doesn't want to go to New York City? Okay? So my point is, number one, um, let it be known that you're sincere before you do anything about getting these people into your church. And number two, before they come, find something meaningful for them to do once they come. You, you get my drift. Yeah. Find something meaningful for them to do. Uh, church auxiliaries, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing that you can always do, you find some folks out there you want to have in your church, have a program and have one of them as a speaker. If, if I'm going to be less optimistic, I worry, and, and to say that I think we have to recognize that historical context that gave America the African American church, which was a context in which African American people were carving out not just a religious space, a sacred space, but an institutional space when African Americans mm -hmm. controlled mm -hmm. so little in this country. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a, a, a faith-based place, an organizational space. I mean, you can't understand the civil rights era without looking not only at churches, but at HBCUs, at black clubs. Segregation, as one wonderful book says, African Americans turn segregation into congregation. Mm. And I think we've lost sight sometimes on the white side of the color line of the historical context in which 
majority black spaces make mm -hmm. sense. And I think you're exactly right. I suspect many churches that I know who want to diversify uh, have all the right intentions but may not know the history. Sorry for an awful quote, but when Unitarian minister James Reeb went down to Selma in 1965 and had the back of his head caved in by a white wielding, uh, bat wielding or club wielding, uh, a Presbyterian minister in Alabama reached out to one of our senators and said he was surprised uh, that Reeb had died because he seemed to have gotten along all right without using his brains up until the night he had them nearly knocked out. I figured he probably wouldn't miss them. Uh, and I interviewed a white man in a small eastern North Carolina town who talked about when white and African American people came in for a kneeling and just wanted to worship there, he punched one of them out. He said it was a desecration of his church for those people to bring their protest into that space. And so I'm not suggesting we always need to wallow in the darkest chapters of our past, but if we, if we can't recognize that we do have this segregation of memory, the event I always point to is October 2001. Most of us remember the fall of 2001 because of 9-11. But if you were at Auburn and you were paying attention, you knew that some of our students inflicted incredible hurt on this community by dressing up in a Klan uniform, mm -hmm. by putting a noose around one of their brothers, a uh, white young man in blackface, by dressing up as African-American sharecroppers, by appropriating the colors of the historically black Omega fraternity and blinging out with mile-high Afro wigs and gold jewelry, and had the audacity to have all of that photographed with a lynching effigy and then young women posing. I mean, it was straight out of Southern history. Uh, and yet you ask most white students about that today at Auburn. There's no memory of that. That was 16 years ago. You ask African American students then, and I suspect now, yep. and that memory endures. Uh, and until we, we get to where we're talking across that divide in our memory, I worry, um, again, I want my church to be so much more diverse, but I also recognize the fundamental way in which we've come to have that segregated Sunday hour. Let me, let me say this too. Another way to um, recruit diversity or to in, in, uh, enlarge your diversity is for your, your church members to attend some of the programs of these groups. Has anyone in your church, uh, for example, attended an NAACP meeting or attended an emancipation program? if you see what I'm saying. Go where these people are and they'll see you and they will begin to f not fear you and you can sure assure yourselves that you don't fear them when you attend some of their meetings because they'll, they'll see that you're concerned, if, if you see what I'm saying, that you identify with them. Um, that's another way that it can be done. But as I said, the, the, the starting point is sincerity. And one, I want to say something positive since I've been, so, those young people today, if any of you were lucky enough to be here at 1215, that's not happening in a church, it's happening in our theater department at our mm -hmm. university. But I look at those mosaic players, and I look at my kids over at Auburn High, Scott may be embarrassed that I'm calling out, but her uh, and Gary's daughter, uh, her address at Auburn High School's graduation in May of 2016, five months before that election, was uh, here is why I'm proud to be you know, at Auburn High School looks like the world. Uh, and it's not to say it's perfect. And I'm sure a lot of times the white kids are sitting together at the lunchroom and the black kids are sitting together. Uh, but she was able to see the potential that's here. Uh, and to have that sort of high moment of watching your child graduate and hearing this magnificent young person see the world in the way that I think we want to see it, that beloved community. Uh, and, and that's one reason why for some of us November was so hard, because you watch our young people and if those young people are the future, they're gonna lead us, hopefully, by our ears out of some of our blindness. Uh, but I also worry that the world's gonna get to them in the way that it got to previous generations. But they give me hope on a day, and, and so it may not come from the churches. <laughs> it may come from the young people. Yes, ma'am.
Anyone else? Yes. No, no. We've had this conversation before. You're a lot more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you remember in 2013 when a young woman with a 4.3 average president of her student government association in high school in Oklahoma, honor student at the University of Alabama, mixed race, uh, tried to, she was being rushed for the sororities at the University of Alabama. And normally, someone with that, those credentials would have had 14, 15, or 20 sororities try to get her. Three uh, offered her the initial T. Uh, when they discovered she was mixed race, none pledged her. Uh, four sorority girls blew the story because they were editing the uh, Crimson White. And it led to this sensational scandal because the University of Alabama has the largest Greek organization 9,000 groups. And virtually none of those fraternities or sororities have black members. Not only that, but drunken white fraternity students regularly harass blacks as they walk down University Drive. Uh, the result was uh, they asked me to come and lecture about the injustice, inequity, and unchristian nature of the sorority fraternity system at the University of Alabama. I found that interesting. <laughs> I'm glad they called you. <laughs> but it was interesting that they said the turnout, which filled all the aisles, had people standing all around this very large auditorium. They said it was the largest crowd of university students they had since Nick Saban was announced. <laughs> the question here is, there were maybe 2,000 students in that auditorium. They all felt like you suggested Auburn students do. The University of Alabama and Greek system had not changed much at all since then. Neither has the Auburn system, despite the fact that we have a handful of interrupt So why should we believe that young people in Alabama are any different than their parents, which is in church and in a setting like this, they say all the right things, and then they join an all-white sorority of Let me, uh, okay. I, I, I will say this uh, as a preference to my uh, response. I talked to a, um, an insurance salesperson about 20 years ago, white, in Montgomery. And he told me his, he was sending his daughter to Auburn. And he said to me, he had informed his daughter, when you go to Auburn, don't join anything that any other student cannot join. And that was about 25, 20 years ago. And I found it very interesting that a white person would tell his daughter something of that nature. And to respond to your question, young people have to ensure that they are looking at the playing field as evenly, or shall I say, as judiciously as possible. And m many parents might want their children to embrace the same kind of racial attitudes, and they do. But one of the points, as uh, all of us are in history, need to get all of these people to see, is something about the contributions that have been made to Alabama history. Even on the campus, uh, right outside of the campus of the University of Alabama, where Shandy Jones, Reconstruction legislator, had his barbershop, and in the antebellum days where whites gamble on the second floor of his barbershop, and how many people in uh, Tuscaloosa history, the city or the county, or even Alabama history, know about Shandy Jones having that barbershop right where Denny Stadium uh, area is, and how whites use his barbershop for gambling purposes, the second floor. If we were to really tell the story of Alabama history, many people would be forced to have a different kind of take on their own values when they realize what black people and uh, Native Americans have contributed to to make this state what it is today. The story hasn't really been told. It comes out very well in the book that you and uh, Leah and uh, 
wrote on uh, the history of Alabama. But how many people read that book who embraced these ideals? That's the part I'm talking about. I, as I mentioned to uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Carter last night, Sunday morning, the very people the pastor needs to be talking to are not in church. And many students in our history classes are therefore a grade not to really learn the values of history that the teacher is trying to get them to understand that will help to make them a whole individual. We have the history here to arm people with the sufficient ammunition to fight racial prejudice. The stories of Jesse Owens, the story of Joe Lewis, Satchel Paige, and not just athletes, the, the, uh, the Drakes from Auburn, became president of Alabama A&M, who uh, retired in just recently as 1969. Um, I mean, about 1962, I'm sorry. We have, we have those stories that we can tell that would really make a difference if we were to let people know that Alabama is not quite as backward as some people would want um, some other people to believe. All of the bad people don't live in Alabama. All of the biggest don't live in Alabama. I, w I would, I know we got to go, but I, one of the things that bothers me, Wayne has asked a great question, and I, I can't answer it in the affirmative based on my experience just this last semester with my class. And I think it's because uh, the expectation that students have in regards to learning, we, our students don't, to me personally, uh, on average, don't come here to really learn. They come here not to be what we call unsettled. Because if you, if you came here to learn what's available in liberal arts college, you would be unsettled. Everything you believe. But our students don't want that. So Wayne's question hangs out there uh, and troubles me. And as a pastor, all I can do is say, I'll pray for him. <laughs> pray that something, yes, sir. He did have the best voice, I want to say, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. But you rushed him. Good. And now my dream is coming true. So as long as we live up to the ideals of Christian brotherhood, I feel like God will honor that. So I just want to let you know there's some encouragement there and a little bit of light out there. We, we, we need that because we've had a, you mentioned the incident 16 years ago, however long it was, 13 years ago. Uh, we recently had another similar type of incident, so we need, I need to get with you to get that information to Haven so that we can share with the rest of our team that, um, and, and in the department, I'm the chief diversity officer, surprise, um, and I would like to get, collect that information so that we can use it as a model for some of the others. Yeah, you, would, you would be encouraged to come over and visit. I'd love to. I really appreciate your sharing that. And I also want to thank the um, young woman in the back row for using that phrase, moral courage, because, yeah. again, as a historian of Southern race relations, I deal a lot in, in the tragic. But there are those voices. Uh, and so for that awful tableau of photographs that I talked about, 
there were young white men in those fraternities who shared those photographic, the codes to access those pictures with some friends in African American fraternities and then those people shared it with the Southern Poverty Law Center and thank goodness they did. So I think Faulkner is a problematic figure but when he talked about the necessity of speaking now against the day, um, that's what it takes are those voices of moral courage and moral witness and the willingness even in bleak times to sort of raise up uh, those stories that aren't quite so, uh, so, so tragic. I found Dr. Powers' remarks about not just, I knew the story of the courtroom arraignment and that overwhelming spirit of grace and forgiveness, but the ways in which building on the fragments and the, the shards of a tragedy that you can find constructive ways to go forward. Dylan Roof hoped to start a race war and instead he started one of the most vital conversations that this country's had in, in years. It's a halting conversation and Charlottesville shows us we still have a lot of talking to do, yeah. uh, but he started a conversation rather than a race war. Oh, yes, ma'am. We should be talking about money. Uh, and Dr. Flint would have those statistics. I suspect there are a number of terribly poor white neighbors as yeah. well, although statistics suggest that our income gaps around issues of racial disparity are widening uh, in this country. So what I would say, the conversation around money, reparations is such a divisive topic, yeah. I think. Uh, it, uh, I have a lot of colleagues who I admire so much who firmly believe reparations is the way to go. But I feel like if we're going to have that conversation succeed, we have to reframe the rhetoric and talk about investment rather mm -hmm. than reparations. Uh, and, and a sort of investment with the full knowledge of historical injustices uh, that are there. But I worry I share maybe Dr. Flint's pessimism or others' concerns because um, reparations, for whatever reason, really seems to shut, suck all the oxygen out of a room yeah. in a hurry. But investment. Why couldn't we just talk about investing in our future and young people of all backgrounds, but um, infrastructure maybe? Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> you know. Good. Yes, sir. For whatever it's worth, the most integrated churches in America in the 20th century were vertically integrated at the lowest socioeconomic level. So that if you want to, if you want to see an integrated church in the South in the early 20th century, it's the Assemblies of God, the Church of nope. God, Cleveland, Tennessee, independent Pentecostal churches, but that's because they had no social stage, and therefore you had nothing to lose by worshiping with black people. Once you get something to lose, then what you have is rabid kind of resistance. Well, today it's, um, well, ain't it's um, I think Seventh-day Adventists, Muslims, and Jehovah's Witnesses that are more diverse than any of our churches. So, whatever that's worth.
who I feel comfortable right now going to a meeting. Not necessarily because I felt like out of a hundred and so many members, I could say maybe three have probably like really connected with us and my friend was made to the point at the end, yeah, I'll just mention that, but I don't even want to come back. I don't even want to pay my dues. So it's kind of one of those, even if we try to integrate ourselves, like you said, if the reception and what people give you is not being sincere and real, it's like, well, why do I do that? And I will say in regards to the fraternity sorority thing, that same fraternity, they have started to integrate new members. And even in my sorority, we have integrated. Now, it's not going to be that we got 69 people, but of course, our groups are going to be smaller. But I am starting to see, but within the African American, it is still that we have the issue now. It's like, well, some people aren't quite ready for that change because it's like, well, this is supposed to be an all like, this is why I started. If you go back to the historical perspective of why, like he said, the black church is the black church, why we have some professional organizations, different organizations, or why the black fraternity sorority got started. But I think because it is happening, and like he said, we're starting to have those conversations that we have more people that are trying to say, okay, this, this, you know, matter how we started, we still got to have our open arms and do what's right. And if we're going to say we're all based on Christian principles or whatever that foundation is, what does the word really say? And why are we doing what we're doing? You know, yes, we are here to make sure our community, you know, grow and stand for and continue to move in the right direction. But how is the world going to change because of what we do? So I can see it and say it, and I have been in that Bible, so I know <laughs> the heartaches and the hardships and all that stuff of what you're doing with but I can say that, you know, I have seen it as small changes, but I think for us who are in those roles, those who work in uh, stand by the committee thing, it's funny because me and Dr. Hunley were just during the break earlier talking about this, and even where I work now, we kind of like, okay, but I think if we start doing what we're supposed to do, and we're setting the example, then the students, when they come, they know what they are supposed to do, and it won't be that, boy, if this is what I grew up with, and this is the values and things I learned, why do I grab what I say, I don't, you know, agree with. So I think if we're showing the right way and being a role model, things can start to change. It's going to be small, but we got to be together. Going back to talking about what, where our hope was of young people, I think about how we started the, the day with the Mosaic Theater. Yeah. Yeah. Those of us all the women who program on campus. Thank you for your comments. Did you guys want to respond? I just wish I could remember the last nine words or so you said, because essentially it is, again, a call to moral courage and that simply because the scale of the problems are so huge doesn't mean that you don't take those small steps. Uh, and over time, I want to believe that the small steps will get us at least further along than we are. Um, so thank, I want to thank the audience. You all have thank been you. really, and again, all the organizers, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Thank Green, Dr. Powers. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. Thank you. I've gotten my chair stuck in my jacket. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, Scott, for everything. Yeah, that's uh, so, and